as a woman as theologian, uh, as I look at this roster, I would be in terrible trouble uh, with all these men standing on the rostrum and at the head table. Uh, let me ask all of the women in the house, would you just wave your hand? We owe you uh, a debt of gratitude. Let's celebrate. Let's celebrate. We live in an hour where people would rather be comforted by a lie than be challenged by the truth. As a consequence, I am eternally indebted uh, to the churches of this community uh, for your forthright prayers and for your continued uh, support in uh, the gospel of Jesus Christ. Uh, our job is not to adjust to culture, but to really speak to culture. It is not mine on today uh, to be a point of a division, but as a point of unity. Uh, not to speak against any community, but to speak to the advancement uh, of black people in America in this hour. Uh, so uh, let me say to the National Council of Negro Women, uh, I apologize uh, for putting you in a position of having to defend the gospel of Jesus Christ. Uh, it, it is not my intention uh, or my task to speak on anything related uh, to a matter relative to a sermon I preached in 2012, uh, but to speak to the state of injustice of black America in 2016. Uh, and so thank you so much for coming. Thank you uh, so much for your support. The St. Petersburg Tampa family, you have overwhelmed me with uh, your prayers and Instagram, Twitter messages over the last three weeks. Uh, I rolled over one morning and I didn't know what had happened. Uh, I said, wow, I didn't know I pastored in St. Petersburg, but I'm, I'm, I'm grateful and I'm glad. Author of some 57 literary works, having survived the three concentration camps, Eli Weisel once said that the opposite of love is not hate. The opposite of love is indifference. And it is amazing that when you cage up the pulse of what is taking place with the perplexities of African American people, that you are finding hate masked as indifference. That nobody seems to care. Nobody seems to care that 13 black women were raped by a police officer in Oklahoma. And as a consequence, it wasn't leading on MSNBC or on Fox. There's an overwhelming indifference when a woman would in fact be snatched out of a hospital and die after it was obvious she needed care. There's an indifference when a musician finds himself in West Palm Beach killed and still we find no justice. And I wonder whether or not we have lost our emotion, lost our temperament, and lost our backbone when we refuse to care. Was a writer out of antiquity, a Grecan poet that wrote the poem, If. And in that poem, If, he says, in no uncertain words without ever biting his tongue, if you do not love ugliness, you'll never be able to love its victims. Because when it comes to the victims, you can't choose the pose on how they die. And so many people have a high hand, but have a low tolerance for people who suffer. Because suffer makes you look at the inner core of who it is that you are, and the measure of what it is that you believe. One of the pivotal theological statements of Dr. King, was that I have decided to stick with love because hate is too great a burden. It's amazing that many people didn't understand what Kanye West said after the hurricane hit New Orleans and absolutely ravaged an entire city. He said in no uncertain terms that George Bush doesn't like black people. He was talking about the indifference he was talking about the luxury of trying to make the poems of people who are victims. In 1984, a rock group by foreigners said, I want to know what love is. 
Tina Turner turned around two years later and asked the question, what's love got to do with it? Many of us still haven't found out what that love is and cannot see it measured and cannot see it acted out. After having studied at Morehouse College and Duke University, I could not find a philosopher or even a rhetorician who could absolutely pinpoint for me the demonstration of love. I really didn't see it in our lifetime out of pulling the pages of history apart. The first time I saw love in action was not after working in an orphanage in Haiti, not after digging wells in Africa, not after trying to educate an urban center after an uprising in Baltimore. The very first time that I saw love demonstrated was just a few weeks ago in an airport in Chicago. I was on a layover and headed on to another flight and I stopped in the men's room. And when I stopped in the men's room, there was a man working in the bathroom. And on the sink, he had a bowl of mints. In Dixie cups, he had mouthwash. And in a tin, he had samples of cologne. When I walked into the bathroom, you heard all kinds of strange sounds. You're able to hear all kind of pungent odors. But there was Mr. Johnson in Chicago's airport, singing, passing out mints, giving out cups of mouthwash, offering people samples of cologne. People were in stalls making all kinds of noises, releasing all kinds of pungent smells. And Mr. Johnson was smiling passing out mints, small cups of mouthwash, and giving out samples of cologne. People came out of the stall and never washed their hands. And Mr. Johnson was smiling, passing out mints, small Dixie cups of mouthwash, samples of cologne. And I asked Mr. Johnson, have you never seen him, never met him before? Mr. Johnson, why do you do this? He said, sir, the only way I can do it is I have to love people. I know they're full of crap. <laughs> but the love that I have to exercise is being able to love them knowing what they've done. Knowing the stench they've left behind knowing sometimes they don't even care to wash their hands. The real reflection of the Christ love that we are to exercise is can you love people when you know their business? Can you love people when they don't agree with you? Can you love people when they come from a different background, a different ideology, and a different economic station? It is in fact unfortunate that last night while many of us watch the last presidential debate before heading to Iowa and New Hampshire. The large sectors of time was dedicated to the middle class, but nothing was said about the poor. <laughs> Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. said that poverty is the bride of crime, and America has declared war on crime, but doesn't say a word about poverty. I wonder why it is that we're in this sacred space while we're enjoying this breakfast. Have we given enough care to the poor to think about even the least of these? Those who can't afford a ticket. Those who don't wear hats. Those who don't have three-piece suits. We say that we love everybody, but do our actions speak louder than our words? It's got to be a season of great discontentment, that there has to be something that you hate, something that you cannot stand, something that in fact compels you to make a change, to challenge a structure, and to upset the status quo. You ought to in fact understand that hate is a great dislike, it is a seething discontent for something that exists without any reprimand. I don't know how you feel about it, but I absolutely hate where it is that we are as a nation. I hate the fact that there is a disproportionate, disproportionate wedge when we deal with the economy. 
that we're living in a place and in an hour that 10% run the economy of the other 99. Something ought to upset you by virtue of the fact that the average African American only has $6,000 in their savings account. But right now in this breakfast has on $1,200 worth of clothes. Something ought to upset you. Something ought to upset you to the fact that we don't have enough to retire. So that our parents are working and working and working and in this hour don't even receive a gold watch. Something ought to upset you. This is the largest generation of black grown people who live with their parents. With no higher trajectory to do more for the generation that comes behind them. Something ought to upset you. That as black people, we are America's leading consumers, but we are the least producers. Something ought to upset you. That we are still in this hour, the last hire and the first fire. And we have hit a concussion trying to break through a glass ceiling. Something ought to upset you. That we have raised a generation of children who have a false sense of entitlement where they have cell phones but can't conjugate verbs. <laughs> Something ought to upset you that somehow or another that we'll spend our last just so that we can look the best and on the inside we feel like the least. Something ought to upset you when you go to church and all you hear about is tithing but you hear nothing about a budget. Nothing about how it is that you live after you live. Something ought to upset you that America somehow or another can find a billion dollars for the lottery but will not feed and take care of our veterans. Something ought to upset you. You ought to be upset about the state of education in America that we spend the most on the military, but not the most on mathematics and science. Something ought to upset you when the dropout rate is rising at record proportions, that our young people are leaving high school in 11th and 12th grade and don't even know that Bethune Cookman and Florida A&M are an option. A mine is a terrible thing to waste. Should not be an option. It ought to be a mandate. We were raised in a generation that said, for us, you better not come home with a C on your report card. But now these are graduating with certificates of completion and don't even know how to reduce fractions. There ought to be a greater gauge for their accomplishment than working a computer at McDonald's. But Florida ought to be raising up engineers and computer scientists and entrepreneurs and you ought not rest until you raise a black governor for the state of Florida that ought to be something that upsets you. America owes you Florida a debt of gratitude. Thank you so much for delivering Barack Obama to the White House. Florida, if we would have just awakened you earlier, you could have stopped Bush. Can I ask you not to repeat the same mistake twice? Whatever you do, please keep Donald Trump at the casino and let's rebuild an America that will look better for the generation yet to come. You ought to be angry that somehow or another Lady Liberty has her blindfold on too tight. That black people are unable to see justice when the killer of Trayvon Martin is walking free. That ought to upset you. When we find no justice for Sandra Bland, that ought to upset you. When the killer of Michael Brown rolls the street free working in a police uniform, that ought to upset you. When Freddie Gray's family still doesn't have justice, that ought to upset you. 
of the nameless, faceless young men and women in Florida who are behind bars but can't find the money to get behind a college desk. That ought to upset you. Living in an hour where parents have to take out a second mortgage just for college tuition. That ought to upset you. We're absent of seeing what love looks like when it's modeled and when it's demonstrated. And greater love has no man than this, than a man would lay down his life for his friends. No man takes my life, I lay it down. And if I lay it down, I can pick it back up again. We find Jesus talking to those who called themselves a student in John chapter 10. And he gives us the parable about a man who's walking from Jerusalem to Jericho. And might I tell you that that man already is bound for trouble because he's headed in the wrong direction. Jerusalem is the headquarters for the Holy Ghost. It is the epicenter for the temple. It is in fact the Mecca for those who are worshipers of Yahweh. And he's leaving Jerusalem to go to Jericho, the seat of polytheism. A seat of an era that said, it's your thing, do what you want to do. A seat where it is that marriage was handled loosely. And he's walking from Jerusalem to Jericho. And so many of us who have graduated from Vacation Bible School, we're familiar with the narrative that he fell amongst thieves and they beat him. But nobody ever tells us why they beat him. Did they beat him because he had on the latest pair of Jordans? Did they beat him because they were trying to steal his iPhone 6? Or did they beat him because he had a different definition of marriage? Why did they beat him? Nobody gives us the definition. Was he racially profiled? Were the thieves actually police officers? Why did they beat him? was in fact a public school system that wanted to label him as attention deficit disorder, not realizing that he was actually gifted and talented and needed an unconventional approach to education. Why did they do this? They beat him and they robbed him and they left him half dead. And isn't that the good news of the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ? Is that if in fact they were going to do him in, they should have killed him. But when you're messing with a child of God, whatever you do, don't leave them half dead. Because if you leave them half dead, they got a 50% chance of getting back on their feet again. And there's some people in this room of life trying to leave you half dead, and you got to testify if it had not been for the Lord. And when they left him half dead, you'll notice that the first people that passed him by were Levites. 